This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We have got some awesome conference games coming out this week across college football. Clemson, Wake Forest, Florida, Tennessee, Wisconsin, Ohio State. A lot of fun games, a lot of conference games in the docket. We're going to break those down, let you know what to bet within those games and the best bets across week four in college football. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst. For numberfire.com, joined here as I am each Wednesday by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work at thepowerrank.com and find him on Twitter at thepowerrank. And Ed, I got to ask you, uh, there was a video this week on Twitter about a new walk-on recruit for Penn State uh, named Chad Powers. Can your numbers account for a walk-on coming out of nowhere looking suspiciously like Eli Manning? Uh, you know, how do you adjust for a alleged hall of fame quarterback walking on in disguise at college hall of fame is a little bit of a push which i, I mean argue. I, I said alleged you know it, i if you throw which the I, word alleged in there you can say whatever you want that's the rule it's it, exactly yeah. i mean i argue yeah. i argue that point with my giants friend fan uh all the time about the merits of, of eli manning but uh, yeah, if you were going to put some analytics on it, you know, you would have to uh, understand the velocity of his rocket arm, <laughs> which I thought was pretty apparent from the video, but it didn't seem like anyone from the Penn State. Well, I mean, Franklin knew, but it yeah. didn't seem like anyone else. Oh, Franklin knew? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, so you got to you gotta watch the right clip. Yeah, so I watched the short one. And what we're talking about yeah. is there's this uh, this thing that Eli Manning did. He did like a, a tryout at Penn State, did a walk-on. He was in like yep. a weird like nose uh, makeup and stuff like that and like worked out as this guy named Chad Powers. And it's hilarious. the clip we'll, that we'll I saw, it. the only clip you see of Franklin is Franklin yelling at the guy for running a, a 5-4-9 in the 40-yard dash. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. Like he's he's given this guy this walk-on grief. <laughs> and I, I didn't realize that Franklin knew. He knew. So okay, okay. Go to Twitter, search up yeah. Chad Powers, and there is. Uh, you want to you want to look for the one with Omaha Productions because it kind of mm-hmm. tells the the broader story and yeah. I think it gets into a little bit of the makeup artists that help Eli pull off being twenty six year old Chad Powers, homeschooled by his mom. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's an even longer one on YouTube, which is also worth checking out. Um, anyways, this is a pretty good laugh. Uh, if you want some something entertaining uh tonight please go please go check that out well one thing i was curious about was like they're not curious about this guy who looks like super old trying to walk on a quarterback but then i remember that sean clifford is like also 26 effectively i think he's like 22 but like he's been there for a decade so yeah. i guess that probably makes it a little bit less weird to have the super old guy at quarterback i mean that's kind of funny that a 22 year guy old guy is so old this right this day and age and in big time college football but uh yeah, and I mean it was fun. It was it was yeah. fun. So yeah, think fast, run fast. Think fast, run fast. Think think well, bet well. Maybe we can go with that. We'll try to work that in here uh, somewhere throughout the show for today. We're going to break down week four from a college football perspective. Let you know what Ed's numbers are saying about this week and much more. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. We are here every weekday, both on the Covering the Spread podcast feed and on the FanDuel YouTube page. So. Go subscribe there if you want the video version, but also check out the Covering the Spread podcast feed to get our NFL and college football podcasts as they go live each and every day. Twisted T and FanDuel have joined forces to bring you a -a one-of-a-kind contest series that gives you a chance to compete for your share of thousands of dollars in side credit. Introducing Twisted T's College Football Picks, a sports betting-focused contest series that is entirely free to play. The contest is simple. Each college football game will be assigned money line spread and total markets with assigned points to each market. All you have to do is make six selections based on these three markets and earn points for each correct selection you made. If at the end of the day, your score ranks among the best in the contest, you'll be eligible for your share of site credit. Head over to FanDuel.com slash Twisted T Picks, one word, FanDuel.com slash Twisted T Picks and make your picks. And reminder, please drink responsibly let's dig in now into week number four and ed we got some big conference games this week uh across all the big conferences but the problem is a lot of these teams have been facing off in non-conference play for the most part thus far and one thing i've always liked about your model is that i feel like it does a very good job of accounting for strength of schedule so i want to go through that process for people who may be new listeners here 
what do you do to account for the wildly different schedules teams have played thus far when trying to project how they perform against different levels of competition? There's two different ways that that happens in my model. So my primary model right now, just um, it, it essentially just teams based on how they performed in games and it accounts for strength of schedule because it has some baseline expectation for how you are expecting those teams to play in that previous game. So, you know, the one interesting example when um, Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt went out to, to really beat Hawaii in week zero, you know, that made a pretty significant adjustment. The markets, you know, favored Vandy. I think I had the game closer to a pick. So you just get a huge adjustment in favor of Vandy. You get a, you know, a huge adjustment against Hawaii. And it's all relative to what I thought before that. I actually bring that up because that's an example of a game in which I'm not sure the adjustment was done correctly, simply because Hawaii has, is terrible. They're trying to rebuild. Vandy is probably not particularly good, as we've seen in the subsequent weeks. Um, so it doesn't always necessarily get it right, but um, that's basically what I'm trying to do. The, the strength of schedule so far is, is baked into what we expect beforehand. And that's in the preseason prior. That's something I feel very good about. Uh, I'm pretty sure the preseason prior is, uh, you know, about as good as you can get heading into the season with the different components that I have in there. And then you're adjusting that based on what you see. And, and you do have to do that in college football because things change very rapidly and you need to adjust on teams. Nebraska maybe being the, the primary example there. The other thing I do is I have an algorithm that adjusts for strength of schedule. So this is something I developed based on my PhD work a long, long time ago. And this is kind of how I got into sports analytics about a decade ago. And you can do this with just about anything. I started with margin of victory in games, and I used my algorithm to adjust for strength of schedule. And you can do that for the first three point whatever weeks of the season, whatever you count week zero as. And the results are kind of complete garbage. Uh, there's just a lot of noise <laughs> and points right now. I was kind of shocked that Georgia was only second in those numbers because, you know, they had really beaten up on Oregon and Oregon had really beaten up on BYU. Uh, USC is the, you know, the best team in the nation, uh, according to that right now, which is probably not true, uh, which is almost certainly not true. So there's a, there's a lot of noise in that. Um, I also have some numbers with success rate uh, adjusted for strength of schedule. And while it's still very noisy over a three-week sample, it is less noisy. And so there are some insights there. And uh, we'll get into a couple of those today when we when we talk about these games. It's interesting that your like your PhD research actually like translates to sports betting. I guess like it makes mm -hmm. sense that like having a math PhD would be useful here, but I guess I didn't realize how directly it translates to the stuff you still use today. Yeah, learning a lot of math is always going to be useful. I try to tell yeah. that to anyone that will listen to me. Um, you never know. I mean, there's a long history of, of pure mathematics that 100 years later ends up getting applied to something. Uh, I was pretty lucky that I was able to, you know, do my work in a field that was heavily into randomness and applied probability and that kind of naturally worked itself into sports. Um, but yeah, I guess it's fortuitous and, uh, you know, still taking advantage of it. So going back to the Vandy Hawaii example, the assumption that the model makes then is that it's bi-directional where it was too low on Vandy, too high on Hawaii. Right. And then as the season goes along, it kind of can better suss out which direction it was wrong and kind of tailor that. Is that correct? Nah, not really. <laughs> Still bi-directional regardless? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it assumes that if you're off on a game that you give equal contribution to both okay. teams. That may or may not be correct. You can imagine if, you know, if you played uh, a team that the quarterback gets injured in the first quarter. Sure. Then that should change things, right? So ultimately, I think the solution to that is going in and going through every game and, and making manual adjustments. Uh, right. That's not something I'm, I'm doing yet with, with my college football stuff. I just kind of let it run. Um, but uh, there's always room for improvement. That's what we talked about with the NBA, you know, doing that for accounting for which players were in, which players were out, how much the spread accounted for those players being in and out, stuff like that. But a lot tougher when there are 120 teams to account for, to uh, account for every single person who may be missing there. So let's now dig into some games and talk about potentially some adjustments, as you alluded to, starting off with Clemson at Wake Forest. Clemson seven and a half point favor here. Total is 55 and a half. And Clemson did cover against Georgia Tech. So talking about the error there. 
the point differential actually was probably in line with what you were expecting, but the route to get there was odd. Offense right. didn't seem to be fully on. Have they done enough the past two weeks to give you confidence in Clemson here? Or what's your feel on this game? No, uh, <laughs> nothing Clemson has done is, has given me a bunch of confidence. Who I, I don't even remember who they were playing last week, but it, it was close until Clemson was able to pull away late. I think they covered still. So on the scoreboard, they look fine. In some of my adjusted success rate numbers, it is uh, is not good. And talking to people who've, who've dug into the tape a little bit more, it doesn't really seem like the offense has figured it out. And, you know, they're sticking with DJ Ugalele, and that might not be the best decision. And it's one of these things where, you know, like when I look at my adjusted success rate, the defense is actually not looking good. It's not mm-hmm. top 10. It's actually more close to FPS average. And there I kind of say, I kind of wave my hands and be like, you know, small sample size. I'm not sure. giving up on the, that on the defensive side of the ball there. Let's, let's wait a couple more games um, to see what is going on with that. But on offense, you know, you, if, if there was going to be a change, you kind of would hope to expect to see it right now. And I simply don't. This game is, uh, is a little, it's a little bit hard to model. It's a little bit hard to handicap simply because we don't know what's going on with Clemson's offense. Mm -hmm. We don't see the improvement in the numbers. So there's a big question mark there in Wake Forest. Uh, the prior, at least parts of the prior assumed that San Hartman, the quarterback was going to be gone for a significant part of the season. He got injured. He had a blood clot issue in his leg. And then all of a sudden he comes back after, you know, missing a week or two and, you know, it's kind of hard for, you know, the model to kind of catch up to that, right? So it's certainly picking up on things that, hey, you know, the offense is doing a lot better. The model has uh, Clemson by nine. I'm not sure I necessarily believe, I'm not sure I would, I would not bet this game based on that. I think uh, this is one that you want to trust the markets on. And, um, you know, Clemson by seven and a half sounds about right. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Wake Forest wins this game. We talked to Parker, uh, Parker, a couple weeks ago about how his model adjusts for changes in coaching staffs, and we talked about this a lot last year with Northwestern, where they lost Mike Hankwitz and the defense yeah. collapsed. Do you yep. think there's a shot we're seeing that with Clemson with Brett Venables being gone now? Because obviously he's the best, there was the best defense coordinator in football. Do you think that could be an impact here, or is it too soon to tell? And you don't want to react into that assumption. Yeah, I think it's too soon to tell from everything that I read preseason. They have an immense amount of talent on the defensive side of the ball, and we expect them to be a top five unit like they have been every single season for as long as anyone can remember. So, you know, is it going to fall off without Venables? Maybe, but let's let's wait until week six to, to make that assessment. Yeah, well, to see. Uh, Parker Fleming was the guy we talked to at Stats of War on Twitter. He was talking about the uh, changes in coaching staffs back then. Let's dive in now to the college game day game of this week. It is Florida at Tennessee. Tennessee, 10 and a half point favorite, total of 62 and a half. And Florida did get that huge win back in week one, but they've struggled since then. So, Ed, when you look at them, when you look at what they've done so far, can they bounce back here and cover a 10 and a half point spread against Tennessee? I think it's a tall order. I mean, they've really looked pretty terrible in the subsequent games. They lost to Kentucky where the offense had some anemic success rate, uh, which is just really not what you want when you have a quarterback like Anthony Richardson. Uh, And they were only able to beat South Florida by three points. I think they were a 23 point favorite or, or something like that. So uh, my models really downgraded them uh, since the beginning of the season, since that Utah win, I think the jury is still a little bit out on Tennessee. Uh, They beat up on a couple of bad Mac teams and then needed overtime to beat Pitt, a team that I, I wasn't particularly high on this preseason. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. And and also in that Pitt game, um, you know, Keaton Slovis got hurt and, and the backup played for a significant part of that game as well. You know, the numbers really like Tennessee's offense. Um, and Hendon Hooker has been, been pretty good. And uh, I, I don't know. I think the jury's still out about their defense. But, you know, when you put it all together, my model has Tennessee by 13 in this game. And the Action Network said this line opened up at Tennessee minus four and a half, which I cannot personally verify. I know there were eight and a halves uh, on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know that uh, I bet a little bit of a nine and a half. I would still lean that. Uh, I would still lean towards Tennessee at minus 10 and a half, but the number's getting high, probably gets even a little bit higher. 
Uh, but probably a lot of value is not, there's certainly not as much value now as it was on Sunday. Yeah, I always find that tough when I know that there was a better number available previously to like to bet into it. But the, but if it's still showing two and a half points of value, like that's not a bad number. Is it a hesitance to think that the model is overreacting to Florida's rough couple weeks or it, what kind of is it just knowing you have the better number earlier? I mean, Florida clearly has talent, and so maybe they come and decide to play, and then Tennessee's defense looks more like they did the second half of the year last year instead of the first half of the year. Uh, You know, all kinds of things come into play. I mean, I would still lean towards Tennessee at this number, Um, but obviously don't love it as much as I did earlier. Right, for sure. Okay, so let's finish up here with Wisconsin at Ohio State. Ohio State now an 18 and a half point favorite. That number is at 19 some places as well. So could keep on moving. It was 17 and a half yesterday afternoon. Now 18 and a half. Total is 56 and a half. And Wisconsin had the stumble against Washington State. Uh, they did bounce back with a route last week, but it seems like the betting public skeptical or at least enthusiastic about Ohio State. Uh, what's your view of this matchup here with the number now at 18 and a half in favor of Ohio State? Ohio State came into the season with a lot of questions on the defensive side of the ball, and the success rate numbers actually like that side of the ball so far. Still a small sample size, but it looks like they're at least going to be better on that side of the ball. And, you know, the unit that actually ranks the worst for Ohio State is their pass offense. Uh, Right now they're 59th. In, in the country and adjusted success rate. And that's clearly wrong. That's clearly small sample size. And a lot of that is like, they didn't really have a good performance against Notre Dame. Notre Dame, we expect to have a good defense, but they completely like suck the next week against Marshall. And so, you know, between those two games, that's really screwing up what we're seeing in the adjusted success rate numbers. And as much as I tell you that these will converge faster to the truth than, than anything else, uh, you know, it, it's probably going to take till week six to, to really figure this out. Wisconsin, you know, obviously had that terrible game, you know, losing to Washington State. You know, the defensive numbers don't look good right now. They look more like FBS average, which is not what we expect out of Wisconsin. Uh, they've usually always been great on that side of the ball. Their front seven is particularly good. It looks like they uh, they used a lot. They used the transfer portal to uh, fill in slots in the secondary and at the quarterback position. And, um, you know, that's that's not a good place to have your weakness in the secondary against Ohio State. So, you know, my number actually puts this at 20, over 20. So maybe a little bit of value at 18 and a half. Um, obviously, it was better when it was 17 and a half earlier this week. But uh, it's always, uh, you know, we'll talk about this later in another game, but when, when you're looking at a big spread like this, obviously it's easier if you believe in the offense to to want to lay that number. And, uh, yeah, you're more likely to do it because because we we know Ohio State has pretty explosive offense, and, and we do expect to see that. And how much do you think that the Jackson Smith and Jigba injury may have played a role in the issues Ohio State had? Because it seemed like in that when he, when he first got hurt, it did seem to have a big impact. Um, obviously, they've rebounded. Now he's healthy as well. Do you think that that could have an impact too in kind of dragging things down for Ohio State and potentially indicate that there's more value than your numbers may indicate on the 18 and a half at this point? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's always going to be bad to lose the most talented receiver in the nation. Yeah. But on the other hand, I, I just don't think Ohio State played that well. Yeah, true. I think I think that would, they just didn't play that well. And yeah. if they play up to their ceiling, they're going to be just fine. Okay, so as of right now, some value still on Tennessee minus 10 and a half and a bit of value, not as much on Ohio State minus 18 and a half versus Wisconsin for this week. Let's open up the board here, Ed. Where else are you seeing value across college football in week four? Yeah, I'm actually going to stay home in, in Ann Arbor here. And um, I actually like Maryland to cover 17 points here. So we have a Michigan team that has looked good, quote unquote good, but they have uh, played you know, two of the bottom five teams in the nation in, in Connecticut and Hawaii and a Colorado State team that, you know, is not cracking the top 100. Um, so I, you know, and, and I think like as good as they looked, as good as, well, basically as good as they looked, the, the competition goes up significantly this week uh, against Maryland. This is a team that kind of had some question marks on defense, but we know that, you know, we expected them to be pretty good on offense and um, 
you know, the wide receiver, the receiver room should be probably the second best unit in the Big Ten behind behind Ohio State. Um, you know, my model has really adjusted them up. And I think the main reason why I like Maryland in this game is, is just how big the number is. It's 17. You know, my model has it closer to 14. And I think it's going to be hard for a Michigan team. I mean, Michigan's going to have to show a lot on offense to – cover that kind of number could they do it sure and i'd be happy to be wrong about this but at the end of the day like i'm not sure that this receiving group is great i think they're i you know i, I think their receivers have been okay over the last couple of years and i think they need to be I, I think we need to see more from the receiver groups and from jd mccarthy for, for for me to believe that they're going to cover 17 points i think michigan wins this game but i can kind of see it being close at halftime you know, maybe they pull away, but um, yeah, I'll take Maryland plus the points here. Do you think that the McCarthy factor in this is kind of lending itself towards a, a tighter game? Because it seems like with the way they tend to play when he's in there, it's a bit more, I don't want to say it's not conservative, but it does seem as though it's more conducive to under to lower scoring games. That's less conducive to a bigger spread. Do you think that a McCarthy led offense is better for this kind of situation because it'll keep things tighter or what's your view of of yeah. this kind of new style of offense they've got i mean i'm not sure it's more conservative under mccarthy i mean i th- yeah. I, I have seen them go deep quite a bit you know with mccarthy um i mean mccarthy has more upside it's pretty yeah. interesting he was 101 to win the heisman uh preseason took five snaps week one and went up to 60 to one to win the heisman and at some point I think last week he was 20 to one. Yeah. He's kind of fallen down a little bit since then. Um, but he's 30 right now. Yeah. Yeah. So he fell down. I think, I think I saw him at 25 on FanDuel at some point. Um, but someone out there was betting him before we saw many snaps this year. And he clearly has a high upside. Yeah. And honestly, it's not like I think he's looked pretty good. And I think, you know, of anyone that's going to adapt to playing against big competition, it's going to be him because he just clearly has the physical capabilities in terms of his athleticism, in terms of his big arm. I need to see this from the receivers. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been talking for you, even even all through last year that I just I'm not sure that Michigan's receivers are that good. And you know, I think for them to cover 17 points, the receivers need to be, be good, and we'll see if that happens. Yeah, I think for me, the thought process of McCarthy might be that he's because he's more likely to run, it might keep the clock running more, which is conducive to a slower game overall. Slower games tend to be conducive to more, you know, tighter spreads, lower scoring games. Even if he's more efficient and like better, that could be the thought process there for Maryland, potentially covering a bigger spread just because if the clock runs more often, that could potentially benefit them as well. But we haven't had we haven't seen him have to run much because the scores have been so lopsided. I'm curious what those numbers look like in a tighter, potentially tighter game on Saturday as well. Uh, also, FanDuel did post uh, the Ohio State versus Michigan spread for November. Do you have a guess? Have you seen this yet? Yeah, I, I mean, I was looking at my numbers. I think right now in Columbus, I'd probably make Ohio State like 11 or 12 points. Favorite. 10 and a half right there. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd probably take a nibble at 10 and a half Ohio State at this point. Especially um, if you think oh. that they cover big against Wisconsin, I think now would be the time to get that potentially before we see movement. If you think that Ohio State covers this week and Michigan does not, kind of thinking the way your your model works, adjustments right. and stuff like that, it'd be better to bet it now if you think both those events occur. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we could be sitting here in a week and talking about, oh, well, I was wrong about Michigan. The receivers right. look great and they they covered a the number. But I will also say, you know, I was talking to Eddie Walls yesterday in my podcast. He's a professional sports better and his uh his knowledge of college football is is immense and it was interesting to hear him say that he actually didn't think that michigan's secondary was that good and i've actually been under the assumption that that might have been one of the stronger parts of the defense and they certainly have been playing well albeit against you know pretty bad competition but after that conversation i went back and looked and i was like oh you know one of the guys i thought was back is actually not back yeah um cornerback vincent gray so i completely goofed on that in my podcast yesterday so please call me out on that <laughs> and they are playing a converted wide receivers or slot corner and uh you know a couple guys that a couple corners that were back last year but also no dax hill and you know it remains to be seen who's going to rush the passer against um an offense with a pulse so 
that's another reason um mm -hmm. i like this game is I, I mean that's another reason i you know that i like maryland i believe in my numbers here you know they they have a pretty good receiving core and and uh i think that secondary will get a test that's another reason too it could be correlated to the ohio state game because of the receiving talent they have at ohio state the ne necessity sure. they'll have in rushing the passer so those bets could potentially be correlated as well uh with the uh, Ohio State minus 10 and a half for the game later on this year. That's all we got here for today on the college football version of covering the spread. But Eddie, we're talking about your podcast, uh, talking about a guest you had on there. Where can people find that and all the rest of your work? Yeah. So uh, catch my podcast at the Football Analytics Show. I had Eddie Walls, who's a pro sports better, college football, NBA, and uh, he's also works with Raz, Ryan Angle Sports, um, which is, is one of only two places that you should ever consider buying picks from <laughs> the, <laughs> one of the only two places that's ever done it um, really the right way. And it was uh, honestly kind of intimidating talking to someone with such an immense knowledge of college football. I think my knowledge of college football is pretty good, but uh, yeah, the man really knows his stuff. It was pretty clear <laughs> why he's a pro uh, after uh, talking with him. So yeah, Honestly, a great conversation. Talked a bunch about music at the end as well. So check that out at the Football Analytics Show, anywhere you get your podcasts. And then also um, uh, check out my uh, sports betting email newsletter. You can get that at thepowerrank.com. Uh, one of the things I write about games that I bet, but I also we also I also put together. Uh, I'm still doing we because every regards used to help me with seven nuggets on Saturday, but it's mostly me these days and. It was interesting to see other media organizations uh, use the term nuggets recently. Hmm. So I was texting with Edward about that, but yeah. uh, catching on. I try on Saturday, like not to make it about me. I certainly put links to podcasts that I've done, yeah. put links to, to this show as well. But uh, I try to make that about other people and what other people are thinking. So I think people really like that. So check that out at thepowerrank.com. You mentioned the football analytics show. I've got my football analytics show mug. Uh, it made an appearance on my wife's Instagram story, I believe, last week. I made a cappuccino in our new espresso nice. maker. And so the football analytics show mug made an appearance, a, a cameo there. So it's going worldwide. Is all Very that. exciting. I think it was a story. I'm not sure how to check a story on Instagram. I've been told you can do it somehow, but I don't know Instagram very well. So yeah, you gotta like click, you gotta click on the logo. Someone, someone with someone younger than me was showing me this. I think I posted a thing accidentally last week when I was at a work event as my story when I meant to post it as like a post. It yeah. was, I don't know. I'm old. I'm like, I'm outdated. If it's not Twitter, I can't use it. So we're figuring <laughs> that out. But the, the football analytics show is becoming Instagram famous. So Remember me when you get famous uh, from all these Instagram stories, Ed. Find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. Check out his podcast, The Football Analytics Show, and check out his email newsletter by going to thepowerrank.com. I am on Twitter, not Instagram. I am there, but don't bother. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. -N -N -E Tomorrow, we're breaking down NFL week number three with Ryan Williams. going to be a blast. We got player props coming up Friday as well. Should be good rest of the week. We'll talk to you all then. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.